Swastias too. Good morning, everybody. Today we're going to talk about something very important in this day and age, in this time that we're all experiencing together, which is respiratory health. And I'm going to present my version of respiratory health, which comes from the holistic tradition. Yeah, the holistic medicine tradition, which is a tradition that actually goes through all cultures. I'll introduce myself to begin with. My name is Chokkade Kartiasa, and I am a health scientist, a homeopathic physician. And I come from Bali, from Ubud, a small village in Bali. And this is where my practice is. And I also um, see patients all around parts of Indonesia and in fact, all over the world. And I've been in private practice for the last 13 years. And uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm actually half Australian. And um, that's where I studied uh, homeopathic medicine and the health sciences. And I have been, while the world has been shut down over these last months, I have been the opposite. I've been very, very busy along with my brothers and sisters, my colleagues in the medical profession and in the holistic medicine profession. And in all the healing professions, in fact, it's been a time where we've been called to the front, where we have been uh, called to bring down our knowledge and actually share it with, with humanity. Because actually it's at this time where humanity is in trouble. It's, it's a little bit of an irony, the animals, nature, and um, the environment is actually thriving in this condition that we're in. It's humanity that has been really called to, to wake up and uh, to reset on many, many levels, both physical, etheric, uh, on the soul level, and on a spiritual level. And in my opinion, when we look at um, anything to do with health, in a holistic way, we need to look at all of these factors. We can't just look at things from a physical. We need to look at things from uh, many, many angles. I even sometimes call it five-dimensional. So what I'd like to do today is uh, go through a few uh, of my practices, which range from hom ho uh, homeopathic medicines, which is my primary uh, method of working, but also into herbs, uh, various vitamins, which we probably, many of you know about already. And then probably one of the more fundamental things is actually the way we breathe. So um, one of my interests and actually the first place where I became involved in anything to do with holistic medicine was through my own journey with respiratory problems, which was I was chronic asthmatic. And I was introduced by my mother, thanks to her, yeah to a man uh, named Christopher Drake who taught me the Buteco breathing method. And I've practiced that for the last 20 years. And it's probably one of the reasons why I'm able to sit with the patients coughing in my face and still be able to present to you today. So I'd like to definitely go through uh, a breathing method that I've created, which is a fusion between the Buteco method and also pranayama which is the, um, the art of yogic breathing, which we see through um, many of the yogic cultures, including in Bali. So um, I'd like to start now with talking a little bit about uh, the thing that's on all of our minds, which is a virus. And you know, what in fact is a virus? Well, really a virus is a tiny microorganism which is subcellular. In fact, it's subnuclear. It can get into our nucleus. And it doesn't even have the criteria to call it a living entity. It doesn't have metabolism. It doesn't have the different cellular mechanisms that uh, classify it as a living entity. It's quite an anomaly. It is a package of, uh, of um, you know, amino acids and uh, information that gets into our cell and can get into our DNA and our RNA. And it essentially runs the cellular mechanisms from that central processing unit. 
And uh, viruses are everywhere. Viruses are tiny. They're on all of us. Quite, you know, as I sit here now, we, I, I have them around me. I have them on my membranes. I have them in my sinuses. I have them in my throat. Um, but what we're facing now is what is called a novel virus. So it's a new virus which humanity hasn't yet had uh, the pleasure to meet until now. And so with all of these past viruses that have gone through humanity, we have a genetic memory which is stored in our DNA, which gets handed down through the generations. And because of that genetic memory, we are more able to uh, mount an immune response to those viruses. And what we're faced with is something which is a new introduction. So many of our immune systems have not yet um, produced those immune responses and mechanisms to recognize that. So that means that the virus is able to replicate much faster and uh, have more success in our bodies. Now, this calls for us, you know, to really take care of our immune systems. Because at the end of the day, what we're facing now with, with this new virus and with anything new on, on the microbiological level is something where we are 100% reliant on our personal, our own innate immune systems. There are no drugs. There have been shown drugs that, that help to speed up the process, but there are no antivirals for this particular entity. And um, the best antivirals that we have are already inside all of us. So we've seen that uh, definitely the mortality rates of this particular virus are more, um, are more focused on those who are immune compromised, who have pre-existing medical conditions and are on a number of medications and mostly over the age of 60. So that really, um, and, and you know, large portions of the population have most likely already been exposed but have not experienced severe symptoms like those people who are in the hospitals. And so it's again, uh, for me, it's a big wake up call to humanity to really uh, never take anything for granted, never take your health for granted. Always um, use every opportunity to build your innate healing responses. And well, the way I'm gonna talk about this will include science. I have a science background. But I'm also going to talk about approaches from uh, a holistic place um, which call on things like uh, anthroposophy, uh, which is the, the teachings of um, Rudolf Steiner, who uh, had a, uh, an organization or a movement which was called anthroposophy. Yeah. And there is a medical branch of that, which uh, I think has given us a lot of very um, very pertinent material on how to deal with this virus and how to deal with this phenomenon as a, as a holistic uh, as a holistic process. Yeah, I'd also like to obviously call on my homeopathic naturopathic background, and then uh, the traditions in Bali, Usada traditions, which is uh, a lineage which I I descend from, and we have a different view on the body and. The physical body being the physical manifestation that we can touch and feel very easily in this world. But we have other bodies which are all in process, which are all in alignment and are all working together. And in fact, um, it is these other bodies that trigger off these immune responses. So I'll just talk a little bit about, about this because um, it's quite important with relation to respiratory health. We have a physical body. And on the outside of this physical body, we have an etheric body, which is how it is uh, described in the West, in the Western literature, in the Western mystery schools. Um, I would refer to it as the, in, in Chinese medicine, it's the qi, yeah? In uh, the Vedic traditions, it's prana. And this body is always attached to our physical body. It's like an invisible force field. Some people even will call it the vital force or the life force. It's actually the, the force that keeps our body alive, that animates our body, that gives our body buoyancy. Yeah, if anyone's ever felt a, a corpse before, the physical material is the same as in the living person, yet the corpse itself, if you try to lift it, feels like a stone. 
That's because the etheric body has departed from that physical. And this etheric body is very much related to triggering all of our life processes to maintaining balance in our body, homeostasis, and it's very, very connected to the breath. So what's happening now I see on a global scale is, is almost an irony. With the shutdown globally, we're actually seeing the air clear. We're seeing the water clear. And we are given, you know, despite all of the hardships, and, and trust me, I, I, I don't play that down at all. Um, there are so many, there are positives and there are, and there are negatives. In any process, we live in a world of duality. But one of the positives that I'm taking from this experience is that it's giving people in places where they normally wouldn't have the opportunity um, a chance to experience a much clearer uh, air, which is our fundamental, is our fundamental, uh, what do we call it? It's our fundamental life force. It's our fundamental life food almost. And the fact that this virus is actually attacking or it's entering through the respiratory channels is another uh, call for us to really maintain that and understand how we breathe. And through my work as a breathing re-educator, I've found that most of us don't know how to breathe properly, and that includes myself at the beginning. Um, when we are breathing in a way that is not ideal, that is not conducive to human life, that is not conducive to the cellular life, then naturally these other organisms are given the perfect place, the perfect environment to replicate. Like I said at the beginning, the viruses themselves are not living. It's a very interesting uh, analogy. We are being essentially hijacked if, if we're open, you know, if, if we're susceptible to that, by something that is not living. And uh, I'm going to go back to some anthroposophy on this, um, which uh, looks at, at uh, the phenomenon of bacteria and viruses as two different paths in the um, development of humanity. Bacteria themselves are living, yeah. They are living, they're, my, uh, they're biological systems. The viruses are not. They don't have biology. So therefore, what's happening is that the more humanity goes into a state which is divorced from nature, the more that we go into uh, what we call the headspace, you know, the more emphasis that's put on the intellect only, uh, with the rejection of the other faculties that we're born with, including the heart-centered connection to nature, the more we go into that almost dry, dead space, the more we're going to be susceptible to the viruses. Uh, one of the analogies given was that the bacterial infections are almost like diseases of the primitive world. I deal with a lot of them here in Indonesia, things like typhoid, various uh, staphylococcus skin infections and things like that. Uh, but the more we see in the cities, yeah, these are becoming uh, places where the viruses are running the show. Yeah, they're much more dominant uh, viral illnesses over the bacterial Ill illnesses. And that is another metaphor, if you like, for how the human race is, is continually moving into these um, deadened uh, environments and that that's where these kinds of things thrive. I'm by no means saying that we have to all abandon the cities. Um, personally, I, I wouldn't choose to live in a city if I, if I had, uh, you know, given the choice, which I have, thankfully. Um, but we can always maintain this etheric body, this prana body, and if you want to think about it also as uh, like the ozone layer around the earth, yeah? Once that, um, that natural energy field is maintained, we, we can maintain that in any environment whatsoever, whether we're in the middle of a city or whether we're out in the countryside. So. I think a nice way to start this would be to talk about, um, maybe walk you through a few of my uh, very basic breathing methods that I've been calling on. I've had a few instances during this whole, um, during this whole 
pandemic, if you want to call it that, where I've actually felt the beginnings of, of um, you know, the tingling in my sinuses, the tingling in my throat. And um, the things that I do in those cases, I, I obviously look at my homeopathic remedies and my herbal medicines. And one of the fundamental things I'll always do is uh, start off with uh, some of my Buteyko techniques. The very basic one, which I'll go through with you now, is uh, called, has, has a few names. One is called easy breath holds and the other is called the control pause. And this is a really good way to measure how our breathing, uh, how, what, what our, the, the status of our breathing function is. And the way we do this is very simple. Um, we take a, a normal breath in and we, no, we take a normal breath out. Yeah, it's a little bit different, it's not holding your breath. It's holding the out breath. And then when we breathe out, we hold our breath and pinch the nose to prevent the reflex of automatically breathing, which is a, a, a reflex that we have in our systems, which we can't override. And we time that. We'll see how long you can hold your breath easily. So this is not a forced, we're not going for a maximum time on this, it's, an, it's called an, you know, like I say, it's an easy breath hold, or some will call it a control pause. And timing that will give us an idea of the status of the condition of our, uh, of our breath, the condition of our oxygen capacity, our oxygen integration capacity, and our, um, and our resilience in general, yeah. So, I'm gonna go through, I'll just do a, a practical demonstration for you. So you want to find a comfortable position, sitting upright, on a chair, on the floor. You take a normal breath in, through the nose only, and a normal breath out, and on the out breath you hold. And then when you feel the reflex, you, know, you feel your body wants to breathe again, you simply release and breathe in only through the nose. So one of the first primary tenet of good breathing, of respiratory hygiene, is always to breathe through the nose. Our nose is the organ that was created for breath. The mouth was created to eat, drink, speak, taste, give someone a kiss, you know, whatever you like. But the nose was, was, the, was specifically created to breathe. It contains the cilia, the little hairs inside our nose which clean out debris. It contains moist mucous membranes. It contains turbinates in the sinuses which warm and circulate the air in a very interesting way. And it contains uh, all of the things that we need to combat uh, and to, to, to I'm, I'm gonna stop using the word combat, I think, you know. We're not at a war here. Uh, I've been watching the news too much. <laughs> no, it contains everything that our body needs to maintain balance, especially with relation to foreign agents like viruses, bacteria, dust, debris, fungus, all sorts of things that are floating around in the air, pollutants, yeah. The more we breathe through our nose, the better our respiratory health is going to be. The more we breathe through our mouth, and this has been demonstrated in many, many studies done over the years, um, you know, by, by various doctors and scientists that have shown mouth breathing increases the likelihood of uh, asthma and the likelihood of uh, hyperventilation, which has also been linked to asthmatic attacks, for example. It also introduces air directly into the lungs without all of those wonderful mucous membranes, hairs, and immune cells that we find in the sinuses. The nose also 
releases a very interesting substance called nitric oxide, which many of us have heard of, related to things very different to breathing. Uh, for those of you who know, you'll probably have a little bit of a laugh. Yeah, yeah it's, the, you know, it's, it's the substance that they've used in Viagra. And it is why, because it is a vasodilator. Yeah. So breathing through our nose dilates our respiratory system and it dilates the, the vessels, the blood veins and vessels and arteries that help carry the oxygen around our body. And our nose actually produces that substance all by itself. And that substance can also be related to um, immune function as well. So I hope everyone did the control pause. And um, that was just a little demonstration. Some of you may have held it for uh, not as long as I did. Some of you may have held it for longer. The main thing is not to force yourself. Timing this control pause is also essential because it will give us an idea. So for those of us who held our breath for 10 seconds or less, it means that you do have uh, what we call respiratory dysfunction. And I strongly suggest that you seek a professional to guide you through further breathing exercises, yeah? For people, uh, what I've found in my practice in general, um, we're looking at around 20 seconds is about the average, yeah? 20 seconds, 25 seconds is about the average. It means that there's no respiratory dysfunction, um, but there's definitely work to be done. In the Buteco method, uh, 40 seconds is the ideal for holding the control pause, yeah. So, um, if you would, uh, I think what we might do, uh, because while I'm talking here, I'm doing a lot of mouth breathing. So that's also affecting my respiratory uh, function. So I'd actually like to do one more control pause uh, so that I can balance my breathing while we're doing this. And let's all do it together. And remember, the first rule is to only breathe through your nose. Okay, so once again, find a comfortable position. Just settle into your body. And take a normal breath in. And a normal breath out. And hold. I have a special interest in the ancient traditions of all cultures because I find that through studying these traditions we see the golden thread that connects all of us. And one of the interesting things I've found in, with relation to breathing is in both the Chinese and the yogic traditions, our life is not measured by the number of years that we live. Yeah? It's not numbered, it's not measured in years. Our life is measured in breaths. So one of the key aspects to healthy breathing is actually to reduce and make more subtle our breath. In the Tao Te Ching, there is a passage that says, the perfect man breathes as if he is not breathing. In various yogic texts as well, it's shown that the longer and more subtle the breath can be held, and released, yeah. this, is, uh, this shows our attainment of, um, of a higher level of initiation. And often through these breath holds themselves, you'll find uh, a great clearing of the mind. Yeah. 
when I've been feeling like I'm starting to, uh, you know, I do these uh, reduced volume breathing throughout the day myself. It's just become the way that I breathe. Um, but especially when I'm feeling uh, anything tingling in the nose, in the throat, the starts of maybe it's an, an allergic reaction, maybe it's a, maybe it's a reaction to, um, to a flu or a virus, I'll do three rounds of that control pause, giving at least five minutes in between each one to recover. And then I'm going to walk you through just one more of a very simple one that I believe is accessible to almost everyone. Except for those of us who had a control pause of 10 seconds or under, just uh, use this one with caution. I would, I would just do um, focus on nose breathing, on abdominal breathing, yeah? And, um, and, and not so much worrying about holding your, about the breath holds too much, yeah, to begin with. You'll need to work with a professional on that. Uh, this one is a, is a variation, it's a crossover between uh, the Buteco reduced volume breathing and the pranayama uh, nadi sudhi, yeah, which is alternate nostril breathing, yeah, and uh, it's a really nice one to gently reduce the volume of our breath. And again, some of you hearing this might be feeling that this is counterintuitive. Shouldn't we be increasing our breath? Shouldn't we be taking deep, big breaths? Well, my answer uh, for that is you'll have to experience this yourself. And um, another very simple answer is, why do athletes do altitude training? Yeah. Why does altitude training give athletes the added advantage? It's because they're training in reduced oxygen conditions. So what happens is our body is able to utilize the oxygen properly. It's a little bit like how we eat. If we overeat, yeah, what happens to the body? Our metabolism goes off, we start putting weights on, where we didn't want it, our body becomes slow, heavy, lethargic. Yeah. However, if we eat efficiently, small portions, you know, uh, for example, in Ayurveda, the amount you can hold in your hand, and we can use that energy uh, very efficiently, that is a tr uh, sign that our body is functioning in a much more optimal way. So again, for those who feel a little bit uncomfortable with reducing the oxygen, uh, that is my answer, but I would encourage you to research that further yourselves. Yeah. So, my variation on this, uh, there's not much variation to be honest with you, it's a pranayama technique, and it is of itself a reduced volume breathing because we're going to be breathing only through alternate nostrils, yeah? So I, I put my index and middle finger on my third eye area of my right hand, yeah? My thumb goes on my right nostril and my ring finger goes on my left nostril. I'll take the glasses off for this one. And feel your nose and you're going to find that one of your nostrils is more open than the other. This is almost always happening. Our nose goes through a cycle of more one, the, either the left nostril more open or either the right nostril more open. And in pranayama, the right nostril is related to the yang energy, the more active principle, and the left nostril is related more to uh, the yin principle, more to states of meditation, uh, passive states, receptive states, yeah? So just feel the breath of each nostril. And whichever nostril is more open, that is the nostril we're going to begin with. So find your more open nostril and breathe out fully through that nostril. And then breathe in slowly and gradually through that same nostril. And then you switch over and you breathe out through the other nostril, slowly and gradually, and you breathe in through that same nostril that's open now. In between, once you've taken the breath in, you take a small pause and switch over. Again, open the alternate nostril and breathe out. slowly and gradually. 
and then breathe in again. Hold for a second or two and switch over. And you keep doing this. And on each out breath, you also take a small pause and then breathe in again and then take a small pause and hold and then breathe out. And you keep going in, in rounds. And as you're doing this, you're slowing the breathing down. Each inhale and exhale, you're making the breath even more subtle, even more slow, even more delicate. One of the things that I do is I visualize a feather underneath my nostrils. And every breath I inhale and every breath I exhale, I'm trying my best not to let that feather move in my mind's eye. And you'll find that you start to get into a state of uh, a meditative state. It's a very good way to get the mind focused and, um, and to clear the mind. And then you will get to a point where you've reduced it so much that you start to feel a little bit uncomfortable. And that's a very good sign. Don't go further than that. Try and maintain that level. And I'll usually do this practice for about five minutes or so. Sometimes I'll do it for a bit longer, for 10 minutes. So, uh, and one thing that's very interesting to do is when you've finished with uh, that reduced volume breathing, the Nadi Suti, then do another control pause in about five or 10 minutes and you'll notice that your control pause is probably going to be longer than the one you did initially. So you'll have already trained your body to this reduced volume breathing. And you know, well before there was all of this, uh, uh, this coronavirus issue, you know, I'd been using these breathing techniques to increase my personal resilience and the resilience of uh, my patients and clients to, to uh, both viral and bacterial infections, and it is, uh, it is definitely effective. Yeah. One of the things that is happening to the patients who go into a critical state, and I found this very interesting and confirming, is that they, um, one of the first symptoms that people experience after this fever is that they get a very blocked nose with not much nasal discharge. It's dry and it's blocked and it automatically uh, prompts them to breathe through their mouths. And in my opinion, from uh, the way I understand the, both the Buteyko breathing and the Pranayama techniques, that has automatically predisposed them to uh, more complications in the lungs, which is, where, uh, which is where the danger happens with these patients. One of the things you'll also find, you may be questioning is, well, you're saying breathe through your nose. What if my nose is blocked? Well, my answer to that is that by doing this reduced volume breathing, you build up the CO2 in the body. Yeah, not to dangerous levels, but once CO2 increases, it triggers the body's reflex to uh, dilate the airways. So I've done this time and time again. When I've had a blocked nose, I've, I've done a control pause or an easy breath hold, and my nose, uh, my airways automatically dilate. One other thing that I do that I'm not recommending for everybody, and again, this might be something that you want to do under the supervision of a practitioner, a Buteyko breathing practitioner. Um, many of your doctors may not recommend it, that's okay. But it's actually taping my mouth at night. I've done that, not every night, but on many nights, and when I've been in trouble, I've done it for the past 20 years. And I tell you what, it is, it is a very, very effective way to improve your breathing as well because mouth breathing when you're asleep, which a lot of us do, and um, it's, it's actually one of the big triggers behind sleep apnea, behind snoring, behind asthmatic attacks that happen at night, coughs that happen at night, is because we, we, we fall asleep and our, our mouth drops open automatically. Yeah. Having our mouths uh, taped, and, and a number of orthodontists also use uh, um, inserts into the mouth which prevent the mouth from opening at night. Um, there's one called face former, for example. Uh, these actually don't just help with our breathing, but they also help with the development of our teeth, especially in childhood years. So, the, so mouth breathing at night 
um, again, will we'll increase our predisposition to catching, you know, or to developing various um, viral, bacterial uh, inflammations also throughout the respiratory system. And having our mouth shut at night will decrease the chance of that because everything has to go in through the nose. So for those of you, again, I'm not recommending that everyone does this. I'm not recommending that you do it without supervision, but if you do want to experiment with your body and, tr and try this out, it is one of the methods in Buteyko breathing that is quite fundamental, and it's one that has helped me personally a lot. Okay, so I think on the practical side of things, that's all I'm going to discuss uh, with the Buteyko and Pranayama. There are many, many more things. Uh, the system that I've um, been working on is called Pranafas. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a joint word made from pra, prana, prana, yeah, prana, pranayama, and nafas, which in Indonesian means to breathe. And it's a, a, co a combination of the um, buteko pranayama and also exercise with um, conscious breathing. The next thing I'd like to talk about is my love, which is homeopathy, and, um, and also I'll be referring to some alchemical things in this as well, which is another one of the things that I study. And um, worldwide, we've seen, um, you know, homeopathy come to the fore in, in this whole situation, partly because India, you know, one of the, the second largest population on the planet, is a very, very ardent user of homeopathy. They have their own ministry. Uh, the Ayush, Ayurveda, Yunani, um, Homeopathy, and Siddha. Yeah. Uh, and this has, uh, they actually, at the very beginning of this, they um, gave an order to their homeopathic doctors to give out the homeopathic remedy Arsenicum album 30C as a preventative measure to reduce the uh, likelihood of developing severe symptoms. Again, we never say that we can, you can stop, you know, you can immunize or stop someone from getting this virus. A lot of us have already been exposed to it, but again, it's how the body deals with it. So the way homeopathy works in this case is through um, the vital force, which I referred to before as well as the etheric body or the chi or the prana. And the homeopathic remedies are potentized substances from nature uh, many of most of the remedies that have come up in the coronavirus phenomenon have been from the plant kingdom and uh, the way that the remedies work is that they stimulate or they communicate with our vital force to restore balance so from the homeopathic perspective a disease is not just a foreign agent that comes in causes uh, you know trouble in the body and wreaks havoc it's not just the hijacking a disease cannot have hold on our body without our body being compliant to it, without our body giving permission for this to happen. And this happens through the vital force. So the disease itself, through homeopathic eyes and through many of the, um, the old traditions, is, is, a, is a work that is coordinated between an external influence but also our internal influence, our internal process. So it is a disordering of the, dis of the vital force of a body. Therefore, from the homeopathic perspective, in order for us to heal from this disease, yeah, we don't go and look to kill that pathogen, we don't go and look to kill that, that invader, so to speak, because part of what has happened has been our own body's response. So the only way that we can actually truly heal from a disease, and, and I don't think any doctor will deny this either, is, um, is through our own body's immune response to that. Our body has everything it needs, everything it needs in order to get, um, uh, get a hold on, on uh, an imbalance and restore balance. Healing is not necessarily the winning of a battle. Healing really is the rest restoration of balance. And it's actually happening on a, global way, on a global level at this time, as well as in our own bodies. So when we introduce the homeopathic remedies, they, once again, they communicate with um, 
with our body's vital force, which is what governs then the internal response. It governs our immune response. It also governs um, our temperature, our metabolism, you know, how we deal with, with the disease, the inflammation, yeah? And it modulates that and um, reduces the path pathological impact of whatever that disbalance or that disease is on the body. And so we select a, a homeopathic remedy on the basis of like cures like. So that which causes a certain set of symptoms in a healthy person if they ingest that substance will also heal those same symptoms or similar symptoms that are experienced in a person experiencing a disease. So that gives us a, a very wide range of, of choice. And um, homeopathy was perhaps the first form of medicine that was systematized in uh, uh, basically experimenting with these uh, substances from nature on, on ourselves, on humans. So as a homeopathic practitioner, I've uh, been part of provings, uh, we call them proving groups, where we actually take a substance, blinded, we don't know what it is, and then we talk to a supervisor and tell them about the symptoms that we experience, and it's quite amazing what happens. In uh, conventional medicine, perhaps one of the easiest ways, easiest examples or parallels of, of that principle is actually that of uh, vaccination, where that pathogen is introduced into the body, and the body creates an immune response against that, and a memory. So homeopathy works uh, in a way similar to that, which, except the, the main difference is that we use subtle, potentized uh, medicines or plants or minerals or um, any, any elements from nature. That um, takes away the toxic element and the, to and the risk, of, um, risk of side effects. Now, during this uh, particular pandemic, what we've seen are a number of remedies that have been researched by homeopaths all over the world uh, that have been named um, the genus epidemicus or um, the type of homeopathic remedy that fits best the general symptom picture of most people who have come down with the, um, with the COVID-19 symptoms. And um, I'll go through a little list and once again, um, Homeop homeopathic medicines in many countries are freely available to the public. Uh, I just heard in uh, news from Germany and Holland that the uh, remedy Bryonia Alba 30C has sold out in many places, which was uh, named as one of the, the most closely fitting remedies uh, that, that fits the beginning symptoms of this particular virus. The other one, like I say, which was named by the Indian government was the was Arsenicum album. Another homeopathic remedy called Camphora 30C um, has been uh, demonstrated to uh, by a number of homeopaths who were researching in Iran, where there was quite a large outbreak of the coronavirus, uh, under the guidance of Dr. Rajan Shankaran, Camphora 30C. And uh, then there are a number of other homeopathic remedies uh, which quite closely fit the symptoms that happen if the virus gets down into the lungs and starts to cause the bronchitis and the pneumonia. Uh, that is really what, what the, where the danger comes in with, with some of the patients who have this. And those remedies, um, from my experience so far, the number one has been ant, ant tart or antimony tartaricum, antimonium tartaricum, given in a 30C or a 200C potency, if you can get it. This is where there is pneumonia, bronchitis, and a, and a difficulty expelling the mucus, which is where a lot of the, the patients who have advanced cases of this have, um, have gone down, is that basically the mucus builds up in their airways and in their lungs and blocks off oxygen absorption. So uh, the action of ant tart, which I've used in the past many, many times for pneumonia, uh, actually stimulates the body to expel that mucus. Um, another remedy which is useful at that stage has been shown to be uh, lycopodium, especially if the right lung is more affected. Uh, then there is calium carbonicum, 
which can be called on um, if the, the two previous ant tart and lycopodium have not shown effect. And if there is severe oxygen deprivation, uh, the homeopathic remedy CarboVeg uh, has been shown quite effective. That's in a 30C or a 200C. This is where we start to get a crossover. N naturally, it'll be a crossover between the medical treatment to assist respiration and the introduction of a homeopathic remedy in that setting. But the ideal way to deal with things, especially in the, with a the homeopathic remedy, is to, to treat the symptoms as soon as possible. Uh, when, because at that stage, what we, you know, the, the English term would be to nip it in the bud. Your vital force still has uh, more vitality at that stage. Yeah, whereas when the, the cases become more advanced, the vital force, uh, especially where the breathing is restricted, the vital force uh, drops lower and lower. Now, from the herbal perspective, uh, I'm going to be quoting the work of uh, Dr. Dietrich Klinghart from the Klinghart Institute, who I respect greatly, and I thank him for the information that he's put out there to the world. He's a very, very experienced doctor. Um, with, uh, with a, you know, an angle on the holistic methods, but also he's a medical doctor, so he has that uh, grounding in the, in the medical sciences. And he was talking about a number of herbs which grow locally for us in Indonesia, and his main herb that um, he'd done research uh, on SARS and MERS, and he found that the herb Andrographis paniculata was his, one of his number one herbs uh, in helping people recover from that. And we have that growing as a weed, actually, in many um, backyards in, in Bali throughout the whole of Indonesia, and it's locally here called Sambiloto. Yeah, it's a herb that's used also a lot in Chinese medicine. It's, um, I'm sorry, but I, I don't have a background in that specifically, so I don't know the Chinese name for it, apologies. Um, but I know that they refer to it as the king of bitters, which, uh, which betrays its very bitter taste. So you'll have to uh, learn to stomach that one. But it is extremely effective, especially in um, respiratory infections, in viral infections particularly. And particularly in, in these kinds of uh, novel viruses, these new viruses, because what happens um, is, is almost a catch-22. There is immune compromise, but then there is something that can occur uh, called a cytokine storm, which is an extreme level of inflammation as, uh, as a, an extreme compensation and immune response to that virus. So what the immune modulators do is they don't stimulate the immune system, but they balance the immune system. So if the immune system is weak, it increases the immune response. If the immune response is over the top, it will tone it down. So that's where this particular herb, Andrographis, uh, is very, very useful. Uh, licorice, Glyceriza glabra, has also been shown to be very effective in this. Uh, turmeric, uh, from Indonesian researchers, have shown turmeric and red ginger particularly, but if you can't get red, red ginger, normal ginger will do, has been shown effective. Um, and uh, one of the drugs, actually, one of the medicines that has been, they've, they've had limited um, research on this, but it has shown that chloroquine, an old malarial drug, has been uh, shown to help certain patients with this condition. Now, I take that and I put it into a holistic perspective, which shows that there's also, um, there's also an effect on the spleen. And so um, uh, uh, herbs like Andrographis, or Sambilotto here, and also another one is Tinospora, locally known as Brotowali, also extremely bitter. And any other herbs that also help to balance the spleen energy will also be helpful. I personally made a blend um, which contains Andrographis, uh, licorice, uh, a local herb here called Tumukunchi, which I found quite effective in uh, dengue fever, another viral infection. Uh, there's a lot of research that's gone into that. I've included that in there. Um, Tinospora or Brotawali. Um, and I've put also in there Artemisia, 
vulgaris or mugwort, which is another uh, remedy that's been shown to be effective in malaria and also in any kinds of parasitic infestations in the body. And uh, so that, that I've, um, I've been giving out a fair bit as well. I've been taking it myself if I've felt the beginnings of something. And so far, so good. Now, on to supplements, which is um, a little bit of a uh, difficult subject at the moment because ironically, after every, all of the holistic practitioners have been putting the information out there, we can't get vitamin C anymore in Bali. So, uh, and I've heard that around the world, you know, vitamin C stocks have gone down. You know, despite the fact that a lot of the medical community says that you know, supplements are not much better than placebo and you know, so on and so forth. What I can definitely say from, uh, there was a Chinese doctor in Shanghai who put out, um, I, I was lucky to see his little cast about a patient in Wuhan at the beginning of this, uh, an elderly woman with diabetes and a heart disease on medication who fell in you know, to the, the high, high risk category and she contracted the, the virus. But uh, there was a difference. Uh, her daughter was into, I guess, holistic medicine and had been dosing the family up on high doses of vitamin C. And I think, if I'm not incorrect, it was around 20,000 milligrams a day. The old lady, however, didn't want to take it. She ended up getting it and she went to hospital and went into respiratory failure. And then her daughter insisted to the doctors to please put in an IV line of 40,000 milligrams of vitamin C. The doctors refused initially, but I think uh, she was quite forceful and they reluctantly agreed. And the woman had a full recovery, despite the fact that she was already on a ventilator. She already had respiratory failure. So again, it's another prime example of where such a, a basic substance like vitamin C is very, very useful. Dr. Dietrich Klinghart recommends 2,000 milligrams a day for prevention. And I think it's a good dose in general, to be quite honest with you, whether or not there's a virus going on. And naturally, you know, personally, I've actually run out of my stock of vitamin C. I'm uh, juicing a whole lot of lemons at the moment. And luckily, there's a good harvest of lemons up in the mountains here that I have access to. Uh, another very important substance in this is vitamin D, yeah? Again, in Bali, we're blessed with the beautiful sunshine. Despite the fact that Indonesia has one of the worst vitamin D records in its population, yeah? Which, uh, again, shows that really uh, this is such a fundamental call for us to get back and feel nature in every, every form whether it be the, the earth beneath our feet or the trees or clean air or sunshine, yeah? Sunshine is so important in all of this. And um, I, I, one of my feelings is that the reason it has become such a big problem in the northern hemisphere is because of the winter. And naturally, vitamin D levels drop and, uh, and there's not as much sun. This particular virus apparently uh, doesn't like the sunshine and it doesn't like temperatures over 27 degrees Celsius, centigrade, yeah. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, excuse me. Um, but uh, so, so we have a natural advantage here, but I would encourage everybody all over the world to get as much sun as possible in a responsible way, yeah. Um, that failing, uh, le uh, you know, good levels of vitamin D and K2 in supplements, has been known to be protective and, you know, against, um, you know, increase the body's resi resistance to multiple infections, but also, you know, it's been used in things like cancer treatment and, um, and autoimmune disease and all sorts of things. So it's a good, a good chance to get your vitamin D levels up now. Ideally, get it as much as you can from the sun. However, um, I know a lot of the holistic doctors who are on the cutting edge of this have really shown that especially in the northern hemisphere, the sun um, conversion that you're getting from vitamin D may not be enough at this time. So um, getting good levels of that is a great idea. Uh, zinc naturally and selenium, are both uh, minerals which have been shown to increase uh, viral resistance. Um, and um, also uh, the amino acid L-lysine, 
for those who have a deficiency in lysine and may have a predisposition to things like herpes, uh, which would show a, a deficiency in lysine, it uh, would be a good idea to get onto some of that at the moment as well. And at the end of the day, you know, supplements aside, the most important thing is to eat a, as healthy a diet as you possibly can, full of, if you can, organic, yeah? Organic vegetables, fruits, full of antioxidants, beta carotenes, whole foods, you know, get rid of all your processed stuff, get rid of all your refined carbohydrates, get rid of your sugar, um, you know, your excessive, if you've, you know, on, on too much alcohol, coffee, tea, etc., things like that. It's really time to clean up our act, you know, on a global, global level. And, um, and I would really encourage people who have the opportunity to do that um, to support our organic farmers out there around the world because um, you know for me this this particular phenomenon has really shown us the importance of that way of life and most of the solutions that we've actually found for this virus have not been found in the chemical world they've been found in the natural world so um, for me, it's, it's almost a message from nature that we, need to, uh, that we need to respect her and that she will provide whatever we need if we only have the ears to listen. So I think on that note, I've shared what I can today. And um, I send a, a, you know, prayers to everyone around the world who are going through this. And um, may we all be in alignment with our true selves and with nature and find oneness in this experience. Om Santi 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 Om.